Welcome and greetings. My name is Walida Imarisha and I teach in Portland State University's Black Studies Department. And I'm also the director for the Center for Black Studies, which is our research center. I'm very excited to welcome folks today to our last Black Bag Speaker Series event of the year, uh, of the school year. Uh, how do you reconcile a lynching, focusing on the work of Oregon Remembrance Project? So we are gonna have Taylor Stewart, who is the founder of the Oregon Remembrance Project, sharing uh, about his work. And then we're going to have time for question and answer. So please feel free to, uh, throughout the course of the presentation, put any questions you have under the question and answer tab at the bottom of the screen, and we'll answer those uh, at the end of Taylor's presentations. If you have any concerns or questions, uh, with uh, the program or connection or hearing anyone, please feel free to write us in the chat. We also have live transcription available for folks. So you can push the button that also exists in the uh, bar at the bottom of the screen to access the live transcription. So uh, we are very excited to welcome Taylor Stewart with Oregon Remembrance Project. Taylor Stewart graduated from the University of Portland in 2018 and will graduate with a master's of social work from Portland State University this June. Yay, Taylor. Taylor started the Oregon Remembrance Project in 2018 to memorialize Alonzo Tucker, a black man who was lynched before a crowd of 300 people in Coos Bay, Oregon in 1902. And I was very honored to get to meet and learn about Taylor's work when I wrote a piece uh, about this work memorializing Alonzo Tucker for Portland Magazine. And I was so excited to learn that he was a student here at Portland State and was like, oh, we, we have to do something together through Black Studies. And here we are. So very excited to welcome Taylor. And again, um, if we were in person, Taylor, I'm sure you would hear so many people clapping and welcome you, you warmly, so you'll have to imagine that. But uh, thank you, and I will turn it over to Taylor now. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Taylor Stewart, and I'm pleased to be joining you this afternoon. Three years ago, I was faced with an impossible question. How do you reconcile a lynching? How do you find justice for historical injustice? Well, three years later, I believe I finally have the answer. It's funny because for the vast majority of my life, I was not the kind of person who could answer such a question. I grew up in a conservative white evangelical environment and I was a product of that environment. I will always say I missed out on one of the most important days of my life in 2008 when Barack Obama was elected the first black president of the United States because had I been old enough, I would have voted for John McCain and Sarah Palin. At 16, I remember I avoided all news coverage of the Trayvon Martin killing because I wanted a reason to not have to talk with people about the case. So even though Trayvon and I were born in the same year and I easily could have been him, I remained willfully ignorant. At 18, I graduated high school, a registered Republican with the dream of becoming a tough on crime prosecutor. I have no recollection of having a conversation about racism when Eric Garner died. I have no recollection of having a conversation about racism when Michael Brown died. And I have no recollection of having a conversation about racism when Freddie Gray died. I started my college education at a conservative Christian university, and I would probably still be on that same path to the DA's office had I not transferred to the University of Portland. I started my time at UP taking philosophy classes that got me to think more critically about why and how I believed what I believed. I took an argumentation and advocacy course that got me to start thinking more deeply about social issues. 
I took an intercultural communication class and a communication across barriers class that got me to realize the issue of race that I'd been avoiding my whole life was centrally important to the fabric of our society. With this newfound perspective in the rise of Trumpism, I realized that a post-racial America did not exist and that Trump's election reflected the moral standing of our nation. I finally realized that the answer to the question I'd wondered my whole life of what would I have done had I been around in the 60s was what was I doing right now? So after two years of a gradual ideological shift, I switched from wanting to be a prosecutor to wanting to be a civil rights lawyer. And because of this, it just so happened that my senior year, I noticed a flyer in one of the academic buildings advertising this thing called the civil rights immersion. And so I thought to myself, hey, civil rights, that's something I'm into now. So I signed up thinking I was going on a simple sightseeing trip but instead this trip would completely alter the trajectory of my life. We traveled to Alabama, Mississippi and Arkansas. I was especially looking forward to the portion of the trip where we'd be going to Montgomery because we had plans to see the new Equal Justice Initiative museums. I was a big fan of Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative and I had heard about these museums in one of my classes. In April 2018, the Equal Justice Initiative opened up two museums. The first was the Legacy Museum, which chronicled the link between slavery and mass incarceration with the belief that slavery didn't end in 1865, it just evolved. The second was the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, or the Lynching Memorial. The Equal Justice Initiative has documented nearly 6,500 African-American victims of lynching between the years of 1865 to 1950. When you enter the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, you are confronted with these six foot high pillars that have the name of the state, the name of the county, and then the names of everyone who was lynched in that county. And there are over 800 pillars representing the over 800 counties where lynchings took place. I had always known about lynching in the abstract, but to actually read the names of people who were lynched in this country made this history personal. I had no idea the magnitude of it all. Name after name after name. What got me most was seeing names with the last name Stewart, knowing that simply time and place separated me from the name on that pillar. As you make your way through the museum, the pillars, which are originally perpendicular to the floor, begin to come off the ground until finally they are hanging above you. There's something powerful about having to crane your neck backwards to continue reading the names, causing you to visualize the way that many of the victims of lynching died. As you continue, you begin to learn more about what was the culture of lynching in America. You learn that minor social transgressions could get you lynched. You learn that asking for a fair price in trade could get you lynched. You learn that sometimes when the white mob couldn't find who they were looking for, they would simply lynch an innocent bystander. When you stand in the center of the museum and look around you, you are surrounded by the 800 pillars, symbolizing the crowd that was so frequently present at these events. At this spot in the center, our tour guide told us about her hometown. This was a small town in Alabama. In this small town, businesses close early on Wednesdays. Not your big stores like Walmart or Walgreens, but your local stores, your ma and pa stores, they close early on Wednesdays because that's just tradition. Well, that tradition started so that everyone could make it to the lynchings on time because lynchings were held on Wednesdays. And despite the history of that tradition, businesses still close early in the small Alabama town. I was awestruck. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice was the most heartbreaking part of our trip. I couldn't believe no one had ever told me about lynching in America before. I couldn't believe that I had gone 22 years in this country knowing nothing about this history and I couldn't believe that no one was talking about this. Why do we not talk about lynching in America? We talk about 9-11 as America's first experience with terrorism, but that's simply not true. 
there had long been an era of domestic terrorism in the United States, nearly 6,500 lynchings. That's more than just nearly 6,500 individuals. That's nearly 6,500 times the entire African-American community sustained an act of domestic terrorism all in less than 100 years. This should really alter our perception of what life was like at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Lynching left thousands of African Americans dead, imposed racial subordination, forced the exodus of millions from the South, and diminished African Americans in this country's social, political, and economic life in ways that can still be felt today. Visiting the National Memorial for Peace and Justice was a profound encounter with history for me an encounter that I wanted to bring home and share. Luckily, in conjunction with the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, the Equal Justice Initiative has also started the Community Remembrance Project. The Community Remembrance Project aims to work in the communities where the lynchings of African Americans took place to find healing and reconciliation through a sober reflection on history. I learned from my trip that there was at least one lynching of an African American in Oregon. His name was Alonzo Tucker, and he was lynched in Coos Bay, Oregon in 1902. There is an interest form online about getting involved with the Community Remembrance Project. Now, I would love to say that when I first saw that, I immediately was like, sign me up. How can I help? But that wouldn't be true. In fact, I was too nervous to fill out the interest form at first. After all, this was the equal justice initiative, and I was a recent college grad with no relevant experience. I figured, who am I to really think that I could be of any help? So I decided I wasn't going to fill the interest form. But thankfully, two encounters from the rest of my trip inspired me to change my mind. The first was a quote from John Lewis, longtime civil rights icon and congressman from Georgia who asked, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? This taught me the fierce urgency of now. The second was the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Even though I was deeply moved by the two Equal Justice Initiative museums, my favorite museum from our trip was the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum because here they just focused on Mississippi history. So there was no mention of Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, these individuals who we kind of deify. Instead, the museum told the story of everyday Mississippians who did their part to pave the way for justice. And so there at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum is where I learned that you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do extraordinary things. And so these two encounters gave me the courage to reach out to the Equal Justice Initiative and three years later, here we are. I'll talk a little bit more about what we've been doing in Coos Bay a little bit later. As for now, I am here to tell you what I wish was told to me so that when you go to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice one day, you won't have to say, how come no one ever told me about lynching before? I am here to tell you about the legacy of lynching, how we can find reconciliation and how lynching is still a relevant topic to us today. Because despite what we may like to think, lynching was not the work of a few hooded vigilantes, whole communities participated in the ritualistic killing of African-Americans. The legacy of lynching was not hidden away in the shadows of the night. The legacy of lynching was broadcast in broad daylight on the courthouse lawn. The era of lynching may be behind us, but we as a nation won't ever be able to move past it until we confront this legacy. Lynching was domestic terrorism. And in this era of domestic terrorism, African-Americans had to live under the constant fear that their actions could result in a lynching. White individuals accused of identical violation of law or custom were rarely subjected to the same fate. Lynching increasingly became a racialized tool of oppression over the African-American population. This history should make us all feel uncomfortable. The barbarity, impunity, and spectacle of lynching are difficult to grapple with. 
What's most horrifying is the celebration of lynching, the way it was exalted in the white community. When you see pictures of lynchings, it's not the black bodies that are most chilling, it's the sea of white faces looking on that are most ominous. The way they smile, the way they lean into frame, I know no greater depths of the depravity of humanity than lynching in America. Black suffering became white entertainment. So what precipitated lynching? Well, a variety of things. One of the most common was the accusation of sexual assault, which was largely driven by the pervasive fear of interracial sex. During this time period, the mere accusation of rape was enough to incite a mob. And any action that could remotely be interpreted as a black man seeking sexual contact with a white woman was subject to this pervasive fear. Something as innocuous as a black man accidentally bumping into a white woman could result in the accusation of sexual assault. This would be because the myth of the black male rapist permeated society as it was a widely held belief at the time that white women couldn't willingly consent to sex with black men. When famed anti-lynching advocate Ida B. Wells challenged this myth about lynching, and asserted that when in fact there was a charge of rape, in many instances, it was really a consensual relationship, a mob burned down her newspaper and threatened to lynch her. Despite the overwhelming history of the rape of black women at the hands of white men, a social frenzy ensued at the mere thought of sexual contact between a black man and a white woman. Moreover, the narratives from the white press were especially sympathetic to these types of lynch mobs and helped perpetuate the hypersexual stereotype of the black male rapist. More than half of the Equal Justice Initiative documented lynching victims during the Jim Crow era were killed under some accusation of committing murder or rape. This would be because the deep racial hostility of the time inspired increased suspicion on the black community whenever a crime was discovered, even when little evidence tied the accused to the crime. There was a presumption of guilt associated with black skin and it would be this black skin that was so frequently sentenced guilty in mob trial. However, it wasn't just accusations of a crime that resulted in lynching. Violating the rules of the social order also had fatal consequences. There was a saying at the time that what the law cannot do, the noose can. African Americans were lynched for things like speaking disrespectfully to a white person, refusing to step off the sidewalk, reprimanding white children, arguing with a white man, and other perceived social infractions. African Americans had to live with the knowledge that they could be lynched whether they intentionally or unintentionally violated social norms. I personally, cannot imagine what it was like to be black and to have to travel into the white part of town knowing the slightest misstep could get you killed at any moment. But even more than that, I can't imagine going into the white community with the knowledge that that community was capable of a public spectacle lynching. What I tell people is to remember what it was like the very first time you saw the video of George Floyd to remember how sick it made you feel to watch someone plead for their life as that life was being taken away from them. But then to imagine that rather than feel sick, you found that video pleasurable. Not only that, imagine you found it so pleasurable that you would get together with your friends that you could all enjoy the video together. Imagine getting a whole crowd of people together on that Minneapolis street so that you could all be there live for the killing of George Floyd, because that's what public spectacle lynchings were like. Public spectacle lynchings were those in which large numbers of people, sometimes in the thousands, gathered to witness the pre-planned killing of an African American in a manner that included prolonged torture, dismemberment, and or burning of the victim. These were carnival-like events that included food vendors, photographs, and the selling of body parts. It was especially popular at that time to take a picture of the lynching that could then be turned into a postcard that could then be distributed to friends, family, or merely kept as a souvenir. Sometimes 
the mob would discuss how they were going to distribute the lynching victim's body parts in front of the lynching victim while they were still alive and those body parts would then be kept as cherished family heirlooms and passed from one generation to the next. Public spectacle lynchings were brazen celebratory acts of sadism that implicated the whole white community and sent a clear message that blacks were undeserving of even the slightest bit of human dignity. This would be because lynching was always meant to send a message. Lynching was about much more than simply killing someone. It was meant to terrorize. You know, my biggest takeaway from the first week of the Derek Chauvin trial was how traumatized the bystanders were from George Floyd's murder. Witnessing that level of callous violence has left an indelible impact on the psyche of these individuals. They will live with this PTSD for the rest of their lives. I can't even begin to imagine the trauma that resulted from white mobs forcing other black people to witness lynchings. Some mobs would specifically harness this terror and disrupt any feelings of safety in one's community by conducting their lynchings within the black part of town or many other times, dragging the body of a lynching victim behind a car throughout the black community to continually instill this fear. Recently, Survivors of the 1921 Tulsa massacre testified in Congress and a hundred years later, one survivor said, I still see black men being shot and black bodies lying in the street. I hear the screams. I live through the massacre every day. It is truly insidious, the terror inflicted on African Americans by the white mob. However, in the face of this terror, Black people were sometimes lynched simply for asserting their own humanity. The targets of these lynchings were frequently sharecroppers, ministers, and community leaders who resisted being mistreated or espoused Black advancement beyond the confines of the Jim Crow era. These are the lynchings that bother me the most, because if I were doing this work 100 years ago, I would probably be one of these lynching victims. Lynching became a tool to keep African Americans in a state of subjugation and repress African Americans' fight for economic power and equal rights. We cannot discount the role lynching played in creating a state of second class citizenship and slowing African American progress during the 20th century. It was nearly impossible for African Americans to build wealth when building that wealth put them at direct risk of violence and the effects of that inability to build wealth due to lynching can still be felt today. It is difficult to fathom what life must have been like for African Americans living during this time. One can even begin to understand the trauma that resulted from these events, having to watch your friends, your family, your community lynched over and over again. We talk about how difficult it was on the black community to see Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd all killed in such quick succession. I can't even imagine the psychological toll that would have taken had those all been brutal lynchings. I don't believe we will ever be able to fully comprehend the extent of this era of terrorism. Lynching wasn't just a Southern phenomenon though. Over 300 lynchings occurred in states outside of the South. The same anti-Black racism that fueled the lynching era in the South existed in the rest of the country as well. There are quite simply just fewer Black people in these states. And so because of lynching, we got the Great Migration. Between 1910 and 1970, 6 million African Americans would flee the South. In 1910, 89% of the African American population reside in the South, but by 1970, that number would decrease to 53%. Our modern day racial demographics reflect this mass movement out of the South. The Department of Labor investigated this migration and observed that, quote, the most effective cause of the exodus is the Negroes' insecurity from mob violence and lynching. There was a famous lynching in Memphis, Tennessee, where the lynching victim's final words were, tell my people to go west. There is no justice for them here. Admittedly, 
the growth of northern cities and the prospect of new economic opportunities did draw out blacks from the south. However, the terror of lynching forced millions to flee the region as refugees from violence. I believe we must pay witness to this era of domestic terrorism. We cannot say enough about the psychological wounds inflicted on the African American community, nor can we understate the psychological damage the white community passed on from generation to generation in this socialization of violence. Nor can we ignore our state institutions indifference, complicity and endorsement of lynching. And so, as we talk about lynching today, I am here to tell you that we are not as far removed from lynching culture as we would like to think. Emmett Till was lynched in 1955. Realistically, that's not that long ago. There are plenty of people still living today with personal memories tied to this era of terrorism. Some of you might recognize the name Michael Donald. Michael Donald was a 19-year-old African-American from Mobile, Alabama, who was chosen at random, beaten, and killed by several members of the KKK before they hung his body from a tree. That happened in 1981. Another name you might recognize is James Byrd Jr. James Byrd Jr. was a 49-year-old African-American from Jasper, Texas, who was killed by three white supremacists when they chained him to the back of their truck and dragged him along an asphalt road where his right arm and head would be severed from his body. His body would then be dumped at a local black cemetery. That happened in 1998. So while these killings differ from the lynchings of the past because the perpetrators of these acts of violence all face legal prosecution, we are not that far removed from the brutality of lynching. The accusation of a black man sexually assaulting a white woman still creates a social frenzy. We need not look back that far in history to the case of the Central Park Five, which again happened in 1989, where the truth of that story is that story would not have made national news headlines if the victim had been black. If the victim had been black, it all would have been written off as the perils of the hood but because the victim was white and the alleged assailants were black and brown, a social frenzy ensued. The same social frenzy that existed during the lynching era. Donald Trump took out an $80,000 ad in the newspaper calling for the reinstatement of the New York death penalty, meaning there were calls for the deaths of these five young men before they had ever had their day in court, just like the lynching era. Those boys would go on to serve between six and 13 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit simply because they are presumed guilty from the very start. The image of black criminality is still reinforced in American culture. We no longer need things such as minstrel shows or racist chrome lithography to embed this image into the American consciousness. The oversaturation of African-Americans as criminals in television, movies, and local news has the same effect of reinforcing the idea that blacks are dangerous and a threat to white society. The same idea that justified lynching. But if we really want to see how lynching has survived, we need not look further than the American death penalty. Our death penalty is the most direct legacy of lynching. At the same time, lynchings in the United States were going down, executions were going up. Lynching began to taper off during the 1930s in large part due to the NAACP's campaign that decried lynching as America's national shame. Hence, your everyday Southerner began to see the barbarity of these outdoor events. And so lynching simply moved indoors where all white juries and expedited trials carried out the same verdict as the lynch mob. During the 1930s, two thirds of all executions in the United States were of African-Americans. Between the years of 1910 to 1950, despite making up only 22% of the South's population, African-Americans accounted for 75% 
of all of those who were executed in this region and this disproportionality continues today, where African-Americans make up 13% of the population, but 41% of those who are on death row. And when you consider the fact that of that 41%, nearly all are African-American males, yet African-American males only make up 6.5% of our population, we have to ask ourselves, how do we get from 6.5 to 41%? The color of your skin still plays a crucial role in whether our society believes you deserve death or not. When we look at someone and are comfortable saying, you deserve to die, that decision is tainted by racial bias. In 2014, there was a study out of the University of Washington that looked at jurors in Washington state and found that jurors were three times more likely to recommend a death sentence for a black defendant than for a white defendant accused of similar crimes. Nearly every sophisticated study that has looked at the issue of race of victim in capital punishment sentencing has found that you are more likely to get the death sentence if the victim is white. This is especially true if the defendant is black. We still treat the accusation of black on white crime differently. Between 1930 to 1972, 455 individuals in the United States were executed for the charge of rape and 89% were African-American. No white man in the history of the United States has ever been executed for the rape of a black woman or girl in which the victim didn't die, ever. Of the 172 individuals who have been exonerated from death row since the reinstatement of the death penalty, meaning individuals that were wrongfully arrested, wrongfully convicted, wrongfully put in prison, wrongfully put on death row, over half have been African-American. We are still trying to kill innocent black people. In Arkansas, it was recently discovered that the DNA on a murder weapon did not matched that of an African-American man who had maintained his innocence over the 22 years he was in prison. Only problem is Arkansas executed this man in 2017. The states in the South plus Texas and Oklahoma had the highest number of lynchings. And since the death penalty's reinstatement, those states alone have accounted for 87% of all executions in the United States. The same region of the country that lynched is the same region of the country that executes. People always ask, how did the North tolerate slavery? How did the North tolerate lynching? How did the North tolerate segregation? The answer, the same way we tolerate the South right now. We are too busy asking ourselves the question, does this person deserve to die for their crimes that we haven't asked ourselves the question, do we deserve to kill? Did you know Germany doesn't have the death penalty? Germany knows that given their history, it would be unconscionable for the country of Germany to systematically execute its citizens, especially if a disproportionate number of those citizens were Jewish, the world would be in outrage. We in the United States would be outraged if that were the case. So where is that same outrage when given our history, the United States systematically executes its citizens and a disproportionate number of those citizens are African-American? Where is the outrage when given our history as a state, a disproportionate number of African-Americans sit on Oregon's death row? Where is the outrage? because I don't hear it. If Black Lives Matter, prove it, because the legacy of lynching and the power of the noose are still alive today, they just look a little bit different. The moral outrage of future generations is hypocritical. We condemn the institution of lynching while failing to condemn its legacy. Everyone wants to say that if they had been around during the lynching era, they wouldn't have stood by, they would have said something, they would have done something. Well, I can tell you, lynching is still going on, you're still standing by, still not saying anything, still not doing anything. We are burdened by our history of injustice, but more importantly, we are burdened by our history of silence and inaction. 
But I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be this way. We have the power to recreate our relationship with history and rewrite the ending to history stories. That's what we're trying to do in Coos Bay, Oregon. Our collective memory and our collective consciousness hold power. What we choose to remember as well as how we choose to remember history is a reflection of the soul of our society. We are trying to insert this story of Alonzo Tucker, Oregon's only documented African-American victim of lynching into the collective memory and collective consciousness of Oregon. We cannot change the past, but we can always change our relationship to the past. What we need is reconciliation with history. We must reconcile the historical discrepancy between who we say we are and who we actually are. Brian Stevenson, executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative says truth and reconciliation are sequential. So in order to get to reconciliation, we must first engage in the requisite truth telling. And we have started this truth telling work in Coos Bay. On February 29th, 2020, we held a soil collection ceremony for Alonzo Tucker near the spot where he was killed. We collected two jars of soil, one that was sent back to the Legacy Museum in Montgomery and the other that is now on display at the Coos History Museum. Hidden in this soil is the story of Alonzo Tucker. The soil was gathered from three locations and each bit of soil tells part of the story. The first bit was gathered from the mudflats underneath the local docks. After being wrongfully accused of sexually assaulting a white woman, Alonzo Tucker was arrested and a mob formed with the intention of lynching him. In the midst of being transported away from the mob, Alonzo Tucker escaped and hid in the mudflats underneath the local docks. The mob stationed guards across town and kept watch throughout the night. So in this soil holds what must have been the longest, most sleepless night of Alonzo Tucker's life. I cannot imagine what must have been going through his mind that night. The soil also holds where Alonzo Tucker would once again be found this time in the morning with the crucial detail being that he was discovered by two young boys. Meaning that just like a Southern lynching, this organ lynching had become so communal that even children were involved in the hunt for Alonzo Tucker. Alonzo Tucker would try to escape the mob and despite being shot once in the leg, managed to run into a shop and cry, Lord have mercy on a colored man. However, there would be no mercy for him. And so the soil gathered from the second location was where Alonzo Tucker would once again be shot, this time in the upper body. This left him incapacitated and allowed the mob to put a noose around his neck with the intention of lynching him from the spot of the alleged assault. However, they wouldn't make it that far as Alonzo Tucker would die from the gunshot wounds. So the third bit of soil was gathered from where the old Marshfield Bridge used to be, which is where the mob strung up Alonzo Tucker from a light pole in front of a crowd of 300 and left his body hanging there for several hours. News of this lynching made headlines across Oregon and even across the country. And most newspapers were sympathetic to the lynch mob. One newspaper wrote that, quote, the crowd which witnessed the last act of the tragedy is estimated at about 300. They were quiet and orderly, and it is safe to say that no such lawless proceedings were ever conducted with less unnecessary disturbance of the peace. Another newspaper wrote that, quote, the conduct of the Avengers was marked throughout by quiet orderliness, but deadly determination. The sentiment of the community is in sympathy with the lynchers and it is extremely improbable that any arrests will be made. That would be true. Despite this all occurring in broad daylight without a masked man in the crowd, no one would ever be held accountable for the lynching of Alonzo Tucker. We began this truth telling work with the soil ceremony and we will continue this work by permanently installing this story into the geographic memory of Oregon. On June 19th, 2021, we'll be installing an Equal Justice Initiative historical marker in Coos Bay. The historical marker will be two-sided. One side will tell the story of lynching in America as a whole, and the other side will tell the story of Alonzo Tucker. 
This visible acknowledgement will serve to memorialize Alonzo Tucker in the collective memory and collective consciousness of Coos Bay. By giving voice to the story in such a permanent way, we hope to get closer to reconciling our relationship with history. However, we find reconciliation for this lynching not by our acts of remembrance, but by how those acts of remembrance change us. We find reconciliation not based on our knowledge of lynching, but by what we do with that knowledge. We find reconciliation not by reflecting solely on the past, but by critically evaluating the present. Because truth and reconciliation may be sequential, but that's not all there is. There's something in between. There is repair and it's repair that brings us from truth to reconciliation. Public remembrance only goes so far. It requires action in the present day to repair the harms of the past. Only through a critical examination of history can the past illuminate the present and guide us towards the future. I don't believe we can truly find reconciliation for lynching until we put an end to the heir to its legacy the death penalty. I believe ending the death penalty is the necessary repair work in between truth and reconciliation. We must repair the fundamental question of who our society believes deserves death because the answer continues to be disproportionately African-American. Three years ago, I set out to reconcile the lynching of Alonzo Tucker and that is still my goal. I've just learned along the way that it's going to take more than a few acts of remembrance because I don't believe we can truly reconcile this lynching while a disproportionate number of African-Americans sit on Oregon's death row. As a lynching state, I believe we have an imperative from history that compels us to right this wrong. I accept the things that I cannot change and I change the things that I cannot accept and I cannot accept race being the largest predictive factor in capital punishment sentencing. I cannot accept the continuation of lynching and most importantly, I cannot accept that no one is talking about this. So I need your help to reconcile the lynching of Alonzo Tucker because I can't do it by myself. I need you to help me end the death penalty in Oregon. So there are three things you can do for me. First, I need you to follow the Oregon Remembrance Project on social media, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Second, I need you to be in attendance for the June 19th historical marker installation. It will be streamed online. There were 300 people at the lynching and my goal is to have more than 300 people paying witness to that lynching on this day. But third and most importantly, I need you to tell someone about lynching and the death penalty. The death penalty in Oregon can only be ended with a statewide initiative. So we end the death penalty in Oregon one conversation at a time and I'm imploring you to start these conversations. It's time to no longer stand by. It's time to say something. It's time to do something. You are now responsible for the knowledge of lynching and the death penalty and what you choose to do with that knowledge is up to you because you can no longer say, no one ever told me. You may not think you can make a meaningful difference, but I believe you can. One conversation at a time, one friend at a time, one community at a time. I believe that you can be a part of a grassroots movement to repair the harms of the past and end the death penalty in Oregon. It just takes the political will. I learned from my trip to the South that it's okay to believe in something even when you've never seen it before. And it's okay to see something even when others don't believe in it. So I'm asking you to believe in your own change-making ability, to believe in repair, and to believe that we can find reconciliation with history. You may not think you're qualified to have these conversations, but I believe you are. If I've learned anything, it's that it's less about being the right person for the moment, 
as it is about doing the right thing for the moment. Even Martin Luther King Jr. didn't think he was the right person for the moment, but he acted anyway because he knew it was the right thing to do. On December 5th, 1955, a little known pastor accepted the nomination to become president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, gave his first large public address, and the rest is history. Stepping into that moment is what made him the right person. So I'm asking you to step with me into this moment. When I was younger, I used to think that it was remarkable people that did remarkable things. However, the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that it's remarkable things that make remarkable people. And I believe that you can be a part of something that's remarkable. Don't underestimate your ability to be the change you want to see in this world because let me tell you, you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do extraordinary things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor, for that incredible presentation, taking us through this history and connecting it here to Oregon, as well as offering action steps uh, and movement forward. So we have a number of questions in the chat and I also have questions as well. Um, and so I'm the moderator, so I'm gonna start with one of mine. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I got to interview you for the piece that I wrote called The Truth About Alonzo, which details the history of Alonzo Tucker and the history of you doing this work um, and all of the effort and time you've been putting in for years to reach this point uh, of putting in this permanent historical marker, which is a huge achievement um, for you. Uh, and I think one of the the you said so many beautiful and poignant things over the number of our interviews and one of them that sticks with me is you talked about uh the only thing separating you and alonzo tucker was a hundred years and that uh i found so powerful and and moving and you you also mentioned that as well uh with a number of the lynching victims today and i i guess i just wanted to uh ask you to extrapolate a little bit more about that framing yeah, um, you know, that is uh, why the National Memorial for Peace and Justice was so moving, uh, because it went from sort of this abstract concept of lynching America to something personal. Um, they're especially seeing names that you would recognize of, of like, there was like a George Washington, and you think about how different those two people's lives are with the same name. Someone named Joe Johnson, he's a basketball player, to completely different lives. Uh, seeing names with the last name Stewart uh, and realizing that this history isn't as far away uh, as we thought it was. Um, and we need to make it more personal uh, to understand the sort of human toll behind uh, these names and these numbers. Um, and so this is why I'm so passionate uh, about telling Alonzo Tucker's story because uh, when we forget about Alonzo Tucker, we forget how far we as Oregon need to come uh, to really make uh, Oregon a hospitable and flourishing place for African Americans. Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to go to some questions. So there's a, a very a great question from uh, Maude Hines uh, and that got a few parts so I'll read it all and then maybe we'll break break it down. Thank you for your work. The way you narrate your own epistemological transformation is especially powerful. Could you talk about your work in Coos Bay, specifically your work with community transformation and remembrance there? Do you use your own transformative experience? What are your thoughts about the potential for intervening in the long reach of the past in the present? And what do you see as the potential for transformation and reconciliation among an even wider population than those who voluntarily engage with this work? So maybe taking that first part, talking about your work uh, in Coos Bay around transformation and remembrance and, and the ways you do or don't integrate your own process. Yeah, um, you know, uh, when I first started this and I told people like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a historical marker in uh, Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, they're like, good luck with that. 
Um, and, you know, I think that we lose hope when we stop believing people can change, uh, when we stop believing communities can change. Uh, and I say that from my own sort of lived reality um, of I was a very different person not that long ago. Uh, my junior year of college, I gave a presentation in favor of capital punishment and my junior year of college was not that long ago. Um, and so this idea of personal transformation, uh, that's mainly what, when I came back from uh, the trip to the South, I really just wanted to be able to provide people with the same opportunities and sort of reflective opportunities that I had um, because we weren't, no one's taught about lynching in America uh, and that hinders our ability to sort of understand our present. Um, and we have a responsibility to the history that creates our world today. Um, and so this is why I am so sort of fixated on education um, and storytelling, uh, especially the, the narratives that we choose to tell ourselves. Um, and I think that we need to be more honest about our legacies of injustice uh, because I think that we need to do something more than just talking about this history. I think that we need to do something about it. Um, and learning about the legacy of lynching has changed my life forever. Um, and so I just hope that learning this history uh, on an individual and communal level um, can help uh, folks. And so that's what we've tried to do in Coos Bay, um, talk about the legacy of lynching. Uh, but also this is the important idea that we can rewrite the ending to history stories. Uh, and so the story doesn't have to end uh, in 1902 uh, and we can sort of fill in the rest here in 2021. That's such a powerful framing, that idea of us getting to actively write history and to make sure, I, I just love that imagery to make sure that Alonzo Tucker's story specifically, but the story of all of these people does not end there, that we are carrying it forward and that we're part of, of writing a different um, reality and legacy. Um, so the second part of Maud's question, I'm gonna combine with a, a, a few other questions that are really talking about how do we reach folks. Um, and so, you know, Maud is saying, how do we, how do you see this as possible of reaching even a larger population uh, than the people who are voluntarily engaging this work? How do, how do we engage with people who maybe aren't showing up? Uh, and there were a couple of questions just around <clears throat> specifically talking about this work on lynching, you know, showing these horrific photos. And there's been a lot of conversation. You made a lot of connections with the police murders of black people and showing videos of that and not showing videos. Um, how do we how do we use that or not use that as an engagement tool with these larger populations, especially who have already decided to tell whatever narratives they they feel most comfortable with. So, you know, kind of how do we engage? Is it important to engage in that way? And if so, how do we? Yeah. Um, you know, I guess uh, really it's about controlling the narrative um, and, and finding avenues to do that. Uh, and so uh, what's in our geographic memory, uh, the stories we choose to hold, uh, the stories that we tell in institutions, uh, in academia, uh, from a museum perspective, uh, has a very sort of fixed uh, spot in our society. Um, and so that's why I sort of generally gravitated towards um, the narrative creation from the perspective of history. Um, and, you know, I know you know this, uh, but in this, you know, in this work, you can't save everyone. Um, not everyone is going to care. Um, there's a lot of people who do not like this project. Um, but, you know, I am, I'm a little bit of an optimist. Um, and I really believe in people's capacity to choose justice. Uh, and so mainly it's about getting them to see injustice. Um, and so, you know, just getting people to, to actually care um, that we had a legacy of lynching in America. Um, and I think part of what gets people to care is to realize that they have some sort of personal stake in this history, that it's not just sort of separate from us. Um, that we live with the legacy today. 
Uh, and so making those connections between the past and the present is at least what got me to care. Um, and so that's generally what I, I try to do for folks is to make that connection. Um, and then, you know, sort of the choice is up to them of like, now that you've heard this, like, what do you want to do about it? Um, and I can only, only hope so much. Absolutely. I think that's a great, it's important for folks to know that. And I think that, you know, the history that you talk about with the civil rights movement specifically is important to remember that folks act because it's the right thing to do, not because they have the majority of Americans behind them. The majority of Americans hated the civil rights movement, of white Americans hated the civil rights movement, hated Martin Luther King Jr. And yet history proved them right. And so, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, just think that framing is really important to keep reminding ourselves that you do the right thing uh, you don't wait until everyone agrees with you because you'll be waiting forever. Yeah, I've tried to remember that as people see me things online. I was like, okay, Martin Luther King died with like a 32% approval rating. Um, and so, uh, you know, which is, I always, whenever people sort of like thank me for this work or, or just show interest in it, uh, it's all, I always very much appreciate, I appreciate every single one that says that um, because, uh, you know, in those little ways, like you encourage me and keep me going. Um, and so just thank you to folks. Definitely. And so there's just a clarifying question about the marker itself that's going to be put up. It said, uh, did you say Tucker's marker will have his story on it? I've read a few articles, some saying there will be a large marker, some saying it will be a smaller bronze marker. Could you clarify? Thank you. Yes. Um, so uh, the, pillars, the like six foot high pillar. Um, there are duplicates of each of those monuments that are in the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Uh, and the goal is to have those monuments relocated to the counties where the lynchings took place. Uh, but the Equal Justice Initiative hasn't started any of those monument relocations yet. Um, and so maybe down the road, if we're lucky, uh, we'll be able to locate the Alonzo Tucker pillar to Coos Bay. Um, and so uh, the reason you're probably asking about a small uh, little bronze is because um, that is what the city originally agreed to. Um, when I first approached them, uh, they did not want to do the Equal Justice Initiative historical marker. Um, and so they had agreed to a small plaque uh, that would go uh, near the spot where he was killed because there are some other small plaques designating uh, Coos Bay history on this one particular street. Um, and so that was the plan February 2020 uh, and then COVID happened and everything went on pause uh, and then George Floyd was murdered and so as this sort of racial reckoning occurred uh, a new group emerged in the Coos Bay area who wanted to do something more meaningful than the small plaque um, and so through their organizing uh, the city of Coos Bay uh, reevaluated um, and so ever since mm, July uh, we've been planning something more meaningful uh, than that small plaque. And so that's how we came to the Equal Justice Initiative historical marker. Thank you. Thank you for also showing us that, you know, organizing works to move yeah. forward. Persistence. <laughs> <laughs> Persistence, persuasiveness, and patience. And a global movement for justice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. We're getting locked out uh, once in a lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of questions. Um, how can we connect with any existing movement to end the death penalty here in Oregon? Um, good question. Uh, uh, most easily it would be uh, to follow the Oregon Remembrance Project on social media. Um, from June 19th on, uh, we're very much going to move towards with this sort of like a tangible repeal. Um, I'm joining the board of this organization called Oregonians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. Um, and so uh, soon uh, there'll be sort of some uh, canvassing um, to sort of actually poll uh, the state of Oregon because they did this like mm, 10 years ago and it wasn't gonna pass. Um, and so then we'll get something through the state legislature and then it'll be on the ballot um, and so follow the Oregon Remembrance Project to keep up to date with that. And so when it comes to like 
putting something on the ballot, it is campaign mode. Um, and we really can't do it without grassroots organizing of people who care. Um, and I really think that the death penalty is something that most people are against. They just don't realize they care about it. Um, and so I think it's really about activating uh, folks who are willing to choose justice. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, that was a great uh, informational presentation. My question is, if I were to explain to someone the statistics of Black men on death row and how that related to lynching racial discrimination, what would I say if they tried to justify that by saying something to the effect of, well, they are criminals? Um, so, you know, uh, th my opinion is there is no justice without equal justice. Uh, equal justice under law is what it says on the Supreme Court. Uh, and so, you know, people ask me, well, what about like Ted Bundy, uh, like uh, Dylan Roof? And yes, we could execute them, but this system that we depend upon to dispense the ultimate form of justice is too flawed uh, to produce anything but injustice. And I would say it's broken, uh, but the truth is it's functioning exactly the way that it was intended to. Um, and so I think that the death penalty and our willingness to kill says more about us uh, than it does about them. And so to sort of answer your question of like, well, aren't they criminals? That sort of goes back to the question of we're so busy asking ourselves, do they deserve to die for their crimes that we haven't asked ourselves, do we deserve to kill? Um, I think that's the threshold question we need to ask for whether we should have capital punishment. Thank you, Taylor. Um, there are a couple questions uh, talking about the attacks, the recent attacks on critical race theory in public schools from uh, conservative reactionary forces. And so uh, one specific question says, how do you think the attacks across the nation on critical race theory will impact your work? And how do we fight back to ensure that education of these historical events continues to happen? And then I, I just want to connect that there's another question asking, is there an effect, uh, is there an effort underway to have this inform the ethnic studies curriculum standards that are being developed? So how do you see this attack on critical race theory or what folks are calling critical race theory, which is really any discussion of race or racism historically or currently in public schools? And then how does that especially connect with uh, ethnic studies requirements or curriculum here in Oregon? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I think we've been in a constant battle for the last 150 years over the memory of uh, our country, the, the narratives. Um, I grew up in Beaverton, Oregon during the, and I went to school during the 2000s and 2010s, and I still had lost cause propaganda in my high school history textbook. Um, and so we win the war uh, by being the one to tell the story of the battles. Um, and so there is this cultural pendulum that swings back and forth culturally between black advancement and white dominance. Um, and, you know, luckily, at least in Oregon, uh, some of the pushback on critical race, they quite, don't have quite as much power as they do in some other states. Um, and so it's kind of, uh, we just need to really take seriously uh, the memory work uh, that needs to happen to, to have this kind of education. Um, and so it's really a, it's, it's a battle of wills. Um, and I really think that's why we just need to garner people into this movement uh, in order to be able to tell the truth about our history, to be more honest uh, about our legacies of injustice. Um, and, you know, that's kind of why I generally gravitate towards historical instances, because you can't really argue, like, what literally happened, um, and connecting, and so that's why I get to some of these, these present day things through their historical lineage. Um, and so uh, the answer to, like, what do we do about this pushback on, on critical race theory? Um, is we just have to like keep going. Um, and like seeing all those news headlines is just a reminder of why this work is important and why we need to support other similar initiatives. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and right now, you know, this ethnic studies mandate in Oregon is happening and the curriculum is being developed. So, you know, hopefully those folks are reaching out to people like you who have been holding this work and are able to provide materials to make sure that that curriculum uh, not only represents a, a national framework around the experiences of people of color with white supremacy and their resistance to it, but also the very deep history that exists here in Oregon. Yeah, um, so I've, I've actually been talking to someone at the Oregon Department of Education um, about, uh, so they're doing like a, a um, so they were going, they're going, they're taking a trip to the Equal Justice Initiative, um, National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Uh, but before they do that, they're going to go to Coos Bay uh, and see the historical marker and see the soil collection. Um, and so creating like sort of this continual conversation in schools with educators uh, and with students traveling to Coos Bay to sort of encounter uh, this history. Um, I have this, I don't know if it'll be able to happen, um, but I have this dream where I'll be able to bring my kids to the historical marker one day um, and they'll be like, oh yeah, I learned about that guy in school. Um, and so that's my, that's my goal. We'll see if it can happen. Um, oh, that's such a beautiful dream, Taylor. <laughs> that's so lovely that seeing this work, as you were saying, like not ending the story in the past, not even ending it in the present, but you're projecting Alonzo's story into the future and seeing just his message being told not only today, but institutionalized as part of the narrative we tell into the future. I'm like, oh, old Taylor and your kids. <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, we have we have another question from someone who's actually writing a paper um, for a history project about Alonzo Tucker and the historical marker, the work that you're doing. So they're specifically asking, I'm wondering where the line is between memorializing and reconciling racial violence and pigeonholing the Black community as victims. Um, you know, I would say that uh, um, our telling of history is incomplete. Uh, if we just focus on accomplishments, but it's also incomplete if we just focus on the injustices. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of rewriting the ending to Alonzo Tucker's story is uh, I'm black and other people who are helping me are black uh, and the resilience to tell the stories that we want to tell uh, is also very much a part of Alonzo Tucker's story. Um, and so, you know, I, personally just kind of gravitate towards more telling the injustice stories because everybody likes to celebrate Martin Luther King Day. Everybody likes to celebrate Black History Month um, where we talk about all these good things. Where we talk about all the famous. We, we don't do the necessary reflection that we need continually in order to make our society better. Um, and so I personally don't feel um, weighted down by these legacies of injustice, whereas they, they motivate me. And I feel like that motivation um, is part of like, Emmett Till motivated the 60s. Um, and I think that this history is important and I, I just don't think that it gets talked about enough. Um, and so I think that part of telling the story of African-Americans in Oregon is telling about the difficult parts um, but that's also like not just there. Um, and so it's partnering with, you know, people like Walida who tell more resilience and, and, and bring up the, the sort of African-American heroes uh, in Oregon. Um, and so I think that we can hold the two uh, simultaneously, uh, even if we're just telling one part of the story at a certain time. Absolutely. And I, you know, I would just also add, I don't think that they're separate. I think that the reality is, is that our entryway to talking about the repression for me is always talking about the resistance. The fact that Black communities exist in Oregon at all is incredible because we were never supposed to be here. And every mechanism of but, you know, brutal terroristic violence was leveraged against us on every level to keep us out and to make us leave. And yet there have always been Black communities across Oregon. And so I think it's about 
demanding justice. And it's about always seeing the black community and, and other communities of color as you know, active change makers and not passive victims. We can talk about what was done to us with, and but we embed in that the fact that we have always been, you know, organizing and and we've always been changing this place. It is our action and our work that has been changing this place. And you know, I know that you have partnered with Oregon Black Pioneers, and we had a black bag with uh, Zachary Stocks, who's the executive director just a couple weeks ago and they're doing incredible work to preserve those stories you know from around the same period but mostly before um, of of black people making community and finding place here in oregon under the most hostile of conditions yeah i am um, so like I, I talk about the great migration where six million african americans see the south uh, but the other part of that story is there are millions of african americans who chose to stay in the south and fight back um, and that's also part of the story. And it's also part of like, ah, there's there's like two per, like two percent, two or three percent of Coos Bay is African American. Um, and so uh, between the 1900 census and the 1910 census, uh, the African American population of Coos Bay dropped off precipitously uh, because there were talks after Alonzo's Tucker's lynching of like, let's just run them all out of town. Um, and so they a lot did leave. Um, but there's something incredible about <laughs> like 10 uh, who decided to stay um, and wouldn't uh, be forced out of what they chose to call their community. Um, and so as we see, uh, you know, there are black people living in Coos Bay right now and, and they're part of that sort of legacy to fight back um, and to not be forced out. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and we, we actually uh, have just another question asking to reiterate that information about how to get involved in the fight against the death penalty in Oregon. So can you just share that with folks? Yeah. Um, so uh, follow the Oregon Remembrance Project on social media. That would be the easiest. Um, once I am done with school, which is like in a week, um, I will be able to do some of this stuff more full time. Uh, and then from June 19th on, um, I will be sure to have tangible things for you to do. Um, and I, I appreciate your, your interest uh, to want to support this work. Thank you so much, Taylor. Is there any last thing you want to share with folks before we close out? Um, you know, it's really, uh, I say it at the very beginning, and it's kind of easy to forget. I just happened to see a flyer in a, a building for this thing called the civil rights immersion. Um, and I very easily could have just like walked by it and never saw it. Um, and uh, just something so small um, had this profound impact. Um, and so the really, I hope one of the biggest takeaways is really the you don't have to be an extraordinary person to do extraordinary things. Um, I really did not feel like I was, I was never the right person to do all of this. Um, I just learned about lynching and was like, yo, that shit's fucked up and I got to tell people. Um, and just feeling that, uh, has, has been enough. Sometimes that's really, really all where you need to start. Um, and so don't underestimate your ability to be the change you want to see in this world. Thank you for that, Taylor. And I, you know, I would argue, I think this work brings out the extraordinary in all of us um, and allows us to see it because I, I think you are extraordinary. <laughs> and I also absolutely believe that, you know, as you were saying that this is, this work has been held by people whose names we don't know, um, but who have changed the course of history again and again and again because of their commitment and belief in this. So um, I absolutely believe, as you said, everyday people get involved and they bring the extraordinary out of themselves into this. So 
Thank you again, Taylor, so much for sharing about your work with Oregon Remembrance Pro Project, about memorializing Alonzo Tucker, and about linking that to working to end uh, current day oppressive systems like the death penalty. I've posted in the chat uh, different links to uh, your projects. This uh, a recording of this event will be posted on our Black Bags speaker series website uh, within the next couple weeks and it'll also be shared on uh, PDX Scholars YouTube page. Um, I'm posting now and uh, the link to the Oregon Remembrance Project's Facebook page, which is where you can see the live stream of the June 19th uh, memorialization of, of Alonzo Tucker with the historical marker being installed. And if we could bring up the final slide of the presentation so folks can see the flyer for that, which we'll also be posting on Black Studies, uh, the Black Studies Department Facebook page, as well as our um, website. Uh, we'll, we ask folks to help share this flyer to spread the word. Um, folks can go in person, right, Taylor? You are having an in-person ceremony, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, so like the that is so planned virtual attendance uh is still follow the organ remembrance project on social media to get confirmation of the in person um i would love to be able to host everyone who would like to attend we'll hopefully i'll have a better idea friday uh whether we'll be able to do that um stupid COVID stuff uh but um you know very much appreciative and you know want to thank everyone who took quite a bit of time out of their Thursday to hear a rather heavy uh, subject. Um, and I, I appreciate your willingness to join me in this conversation. Great, thank you so much. So yes, uh, folks can plan on uh, watching the live stream and we in uh, Portland State Black Studies and PSU's AV support are uh, working together to make sure that live stream happens so that folks everywhere can access it. So that'll be June 19th, 10 a.m. Um, and uh, folks can watch that and keep up with Oregon Remembrance Project on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram to find out more information. Um, thank you all so much for joining us, for being part of today. Um, and thank you again, Taylor, for your work. And you know, we at Portland State and at Black Studies are so proud to be able to, you know, have supported this work and and excited to see you go off after graduation in just a couple weeks to to do this work even in in even more depth. So Thank you all so much and take care. Thank you. Go Blazers. We need this one tonight. <laughs> <laughs>